Hey, welcome to The Perspective today. Mike Sherbino here, and we're going to be talking about a subject that literally is close to home. We're talking about handling your children, not just young children, but what about older children? And then what about adult children? And how do you do that? How do you have the conversation from adult to adult? Joining me in a few minutes is Trish Purdy, who's been on the program before, and she's willing to go where very few have ventured to go before. But as I was thinking about the show for today, I was reminded of the story of a lady by the name of Edith. Edith lived in Mississippi, and she had five preschool children. Imagine that. Anyways, she noticed that they were very quiet for reasons she didn't know why, and that is always an alarm bell. And so she went into the living room to see what they were up to. And they were sitting in a circle on the floor. And in the middle of them were a couple of baby skunks. Can you imagine that? And like any good mother, Edith screamed at the top of her lungs. And she said, children, run, run. And the kids bent down and picked up the skunks. And they ran out the door. Well, enough said. You know, we're going to talk today about raising kids, as I said, whether they're young and when they're old, the pressures that that brings, how we cope with life, how we cope with the anxieties, the ups and downs, uh, sometimes the shattered dreams, the, the dreams that have had to be realigned. I'm really glad that Trish Purdy is with us. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, she's been on the program before. Uh, she's a counselor in the Halifax Regional Municipality. She's a mother of gazillion kids. We're going to let her explain that. Uh, married to Ken. I've known Trish and Ken for years. And at one stage in our journey, my wife, Terry, and I, we kind of said that Trish was our sixth daughter. So welcome back, Trish. Thanks for coming on, being brave to come. And uh, how is life in Halifax? Well, thanks for having me, Mike, again. Good to see you. And life in Halifax? Busy, busy, good. Well, yeah. it seems to be busy all across the country. And there's that thing called work. And then there's a thing called home. What's busier for you these days? Oh my goodness. It's everything's been busy. <laughs> maybe, like the better, maybe the better question is what's taking up your mental headspace? Oh my goodness. Everything. And that's what we're going to talk about today. What do we do when the head doesn't have any room left? How do we cope? But how do we deal with that anxiety? And as you have been a mother, how many kids do you actually have? Just explain that scenario because it is kind of humorous. Well, See, we have three biological kids and then three kids have entered into our family over the last what, 15 years for two of them and then eight years going on nine years for, for the third. So they're, um, it's, it's a big family, com complex, uh, lots of good times, but lots of times where I want to tear my hair out. It's good that I got the care because uh, there's lots of, lots of that too. Yeah. Well, your hair is a lot thicker than mine. So I stopped doing that, but, uh, so yeah, yours still looks great. Okay. What causes things to come unglued in your home or in the homes that you've observed? Well, when I've been on your show before, we talked about very difficult marriage that I have was in and, and still in. I mean, it doesn't, doesn't go away uh, when you've been married for 27 years. But, but with that came a lot of regret for how I handled myself, how I handled mothering, how I handled parenting issues with the kids. Um, I wasn't able to process my own emotional pain. So of course, what do you do? You usually take it out on the ones close to you. So uh, having gone through the process of, I guess, coming to terms with that, accepting that and, you know, going to all the kids and apologizing and, you know, many times and they're like, mom, it's fine. It's fine. But as a mom, I found it very difficult to learn what to do with that guilt. Um, it doesn't just go away because mentally I know the truth and I, I am a born again Christian. So I really, I, I believe the Bible is the word of God. I know that the cross of Jesus Christ is where we lay all of our sin, all of our guilt, all of our burdens. And I know 
that he is faithful and just to forgive us from all of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness when we do that. Sometimes, oh. though, the emotions don't obey what the logic and the brain and the intellect tell us. So I, I found myself there when my adult children are making choices that literally tear my heart out. Yeah, and that's hard. I can't control it. So it's been like the challenge of, of what to do with all of that. So let me ask a question. When your adult kids are making choices that you can't control, how do you dialogue? What are you learning to do at this stage? I am such an overbearing personality, and that's kind of been how I've rolled as a mom. And I'm really trying to roll that back. Um, I don't want to control. I, I want my kids to be adults and to make their choices. And I, I guess with the reading I'm doing, uh, listening to podcasts, you know, and just realizing, okay, I, I, I see that I've had some codependency ways about me. I, I don't want to be like that anymore. So it. It's been trying to offer facts and unconditional love yeah. and then letting the decisions be made because what else am I going to do? Try to fix it, try to control it. That doesn't work. So, and pray. Yeah, when you say that, I mean, Trish, this is raw. I mean, you're talking about stuff that's close to my heart. Uh, I'm sure every parent who is watching right now. And, and I don't think you have the answer to this, but maybe you've got a, an inkling. And the, my question is, when you and I as adults, we know we've messed up, we've made mistakes, we want to pass that on to our kids so they don't make the same mistakes. Why is it that they seem to be such blockheads and don't take it in? Oh, Mike, I remember when I was a youngster myself in the 18, 19 year old phase. And I remember your family graciously taking me in because I didn't have anywhere else to go. And I was in the midst of crisis. And I, I mean, I remember you sitting me down at the kitchen table and trying to talk sense to me and trying to tell me that, oh, yeah, actually, you do need insurance on your car. You really shouldn't be driving you for <laughs> kids around in an uninsured car. Yeah, like that's kind of mandatory. It's not like a choice that you can make. Um, you know, yeah, you do need to put oil in your in your engine. You know, you know, like you 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 sat me down to tell me these things, but did I like I don't even know if I even listened. Like I didn't even know if I had the capacity to. So I think sometimes we just need to like live and and grow out of it. And honestly this is bad, but I think pain can is sometimes our best teacher. Well, so pain in our kids' lives, even though, I mean, it's the thing that you spend your whole life as a mother and father trying to prevent, it it's actually can serve to be the best teacher for them because they end up like we did, you know, in the corner, in the fetal position going, okay, Lord, now what? And, and sometimes that's where our brains can kind of sometimes go, okay, I don't want to keep doing what I've been doing. Because this is the result. So what do I need to change in order to change the trajectory of my life? And and that can be the greatest gift ever. One of the things that has helped so many people, Trish, is as you've shared your conversations that you've had with the Lord when you've been in that fetal position for all sorts of reasons. What are some of the lessons that God has taught you in those moments when you just say, you know, pull the covers over me and call me in 10 years? Yeah, I know. I He never lets me stay there. I mean, it. he never lets me stay there. Self-pity is such a dangerous, dangerous thing because it's so, it's so, uh, what's the word? Like enticing. It, it feels justified, like that self-pity feeling. And yet it's a noose around your neck. It, it will literally destroy you. It, it, it just kills every hope, every, every, every trust in a living God to, to perform miracles and, and to believe that God is when, when I'm in those places, it's usually God gives a word from scripture or someone from his body, someone from who is a, a believer that has uh, praise for me or shares scripture with me, that those are things that actually have power to break that, that spell of self pity where I want to stay in that fetal position. 
and then it gives it gives me energy to to kind of keep going and to pray because sometimes you get so discouraged you don't even want to pray anymore and you like yeah. as a christian you know you're in a bad place when you reach that rock bottom of, of not even wanting to pray because you're like what's the use we're going to come back talking to trish purdy in just a moment we're going to talk about how to get out of that spot when you just feel like oh you can't move ahead and if at any time you want to talk to somebody right now on the program or through the rest of the day, you can call our toll-free number, 855-910-6297. Or you can write me, prayer at theperspective.tv. I'd love to pray for you. We'll respond to you personally. I will get back to you. And there's so many people waiting to talk to you right now on our prayer line. We'd love to hear from you. We're going to be back in just a moment with uh, Municipal Counselor Trish Purdy in just a moment. Welcome back to The Perspective. I'm here with Trish Purdy. And Trish, what we're talking about is stuff that is so close to our heart. You know, we're talking about being in the fetal position. And, you know, it's one thing when we're young kids, we can pout and scream and go off and have a little tantrum. But mommy or daddy's hopefully still going to keep paying the bills. Here's the question. When, when you've just been overwhelmed with life, how do you keep pressing on? You got to go to work. You represent a, a, a large municipality in Halifax. How do you do it? Well, it's been challenging, but um, one one thing that I do is um, try to put all my trust in the Lord. And so what, one thing I'm learning is I don't need to spend all my mental energy thinking about the problem. In fact, that's quite counterproductive. Um, like I, I, trusting God means taking myself away from the issues and leaving it with him, uh, and to know that he's actually working, uh, on my behalf because I have prayed and I am called by him. And we have this beautiful scripture in Romans eight twenty eight that, you know, for all of us who are called according to his will, he works all things for good. So yeah. either that is true or it's not true. So knowing that we're not at the end of the story yet, we, we are in a process and we're, going, we're moving through this story. And I don't have the narrative in my head of what's going to happen today, tomorrow, next week, next year. Like, how would I even have a clue? So why would I base my emotion on something that's not even factual? It, it's all just narrative in, in my head based on what I'm feeling. So these things have been very helpful. They're very practical. They're very helpful for me to be able to continue to work while you're dealing with incredible stress with adult children that sometimes you feel could literally break your heart in two. Yeah. And so it it works that this work, God works, and he doesn't leave us to tackle these huge issues alone. He's promised to never leave us or forsake us in the midst of our journey, no matter what that looks like or what we feel like at, at any given time. And I, I heard a quote that's actually been so helpful for me, shared it with all my kids. Pain is inevitable, but misery is optional. <laughs> Love that. Okay. I want you to help me deal with a question that I know you've experienced, but I get asked this or people come often at church service that come and ask for prayer. And here's the question. Uh, they'll say to me, you know, will you pray for my kid because they won't talk to me anymore? How do you handle that? Have there been things that you've learned to uh, open up the conversation? And sometimes what happens is while people will talk in a formal way, you know, hello, how are you? Yes. We're talking about heart to heart conversation. They don't want to open up. How have you managed that one? I was told two rules of parenting adult children. And these, these things I, I believe are true, change the way that I am dealing with my own family. Number one, 
you love your kids unconditionally, no matter what, no matter what they have done, doing, presently doing, you love them unconditionally. You know that you make sure that they know that nothing that they do or say is going to change your love for them. And number two, you let them go. You give them to the Lord, like really give them to the Lord. And I think those two things are powerful. I, I met with, with one of my girls, she was going through a rebellion and she wouldn't talk to me and she was so rude and she would hurt me every time she would come to the house or just like dig, you know, and, and there was no closeness during this time of a couple of years and it was, it was hurting me badly. But I, I just felt not to, not to lecture her, not to say, you know, that's rude. You shouldn't really speak to your mother that way. No, I, I just tried to love on her. I tried to be gracious and kind to her, even though when she would leave, I'd go all my head off because, you know, my heart was hurting. Uh, and I was scared for her because she was such a hard heart at that time. And, you know, I've been able to see the Lord work in her life and she's come full circle and she is my best friend. She is serving the Lord and she just married a wonderful man who loves the Lord just a few months ago. And wow. so it, it, it's been wonderful to see that. But then I have, you know, for example, another child um, who doesn't open up, who doesn't speak. But I think as parents, we we shouldn't expect them to do what they're not capable of doing. What what if what if we were expected to do things that we're not capable of doing at this time? If we can love them unconditionally and let them go and give them to God, and you know, be faithful in our prayer for our children, then God is going to work all things for our good because we are being faithful with what He has given us. We can't control it. We can't make anyone do anything that we want them to do. And I think acceptance of that fact is really powerful. As long as we're trying to change them to to get them to make us feel more comfortable in in our own skin, that's never going to work. They'll see right through it. <laughs> okay, I'm going to ask uh, a slightly different question. We talked about it in the first part of the interview. You you talked about going to your kids and asking for forgiveness. What does that look like? And is sometimes do you think that's viewed by our kids as a, an emotional ploy? Because I, for one, I do believe if we've done something wrong, we need to go and say, I apologize. But there has to be a point where you stop beating yourself up. So unpack to us what forgiveness looks like for you in the relationships with your kids. My kids have been very gracious and uh, like they, they're like, oh, you don't even need to ask for forgiveness. You know, when I've gone to that, they, they've been too good to me. And maybe they're in denial still, and that had to come come back to me at one point. That's fine. Um, but yeah, that's a good question. I'm still trying to work out the guilt thing. Um, come a long way. Not it's it's not crippling like it used to be. Um, look, I, I think what we allow our mind to focus on is so powerful, and and when we can really catch ourselves focusing on the wrong things, the negative things, like what are the things that steal joy, that steal light, that steal peace from us. So those are things that maybe we can recognize as going, okay, this this is not productive to be allowing this in in my head because it's literally draining all of yeah. the energy that I need to live. Um, but w- whenever I felt a burden or or like I've read something in a book that triggered me, I will go to, you know, the kids and just say, you know, I... I really messed up here. I'm I'm really sorry. And it's not always in appropriate places either. Like it could be in a driveway and someone's leaving and I'm like, oh my gosh, I need to ask you to forgive me. So so it's it's not perfect by any means, but I I feel my kids have been so gracious and so uh so uh generous in yeah. in in giving their forgiveness to me. Well, you've actually been generous to me because you've gotten away for a couple of days just to take time for yourself and to be quiet. And yet you've given time to us here in the perspective today. Uh, let's wrap up in the last minute by me asking this question. What are some of the takeaways that God has been speaking into your heart over these last few days as you've had to pull out of the, the fight before you go back into it? Yeah, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. I serve a living God. He, wow. he rose from the dead. He, he defeated death in the grave. Uh, 
it says that Jesus was made manifest to destroy the works of the devil in first John. I mean, it's going to be okay. Uh, the focus can be so negative and it can suck our energy. And when we're in the battle, I mean, sometimes it's so hard to see clearly, right? Because you're, you're overwhelmed and, and you're being pulled in so many directions because we don't just have families. We got marriages. We, we have, uh, you know, church, we have work that can be very, very, you know, burdensome at times and, and a lot of, you know, effort and, and time being needed to go into that, but it's going to be okay. You know, I read something in John uh, this summer that was so powerful to me. And I'll just share it with you. It's when Jesus is talking to Martha, her, her, her brother Lazarus had just died and he's in the grave. And, you know, Martha and Mary are blaming him. You know, Jesus, if you had been here, this wouldn't have happened. I mean, how many times have we said that? Jesus, if you had just answered that prayer, this wouldn't have happened. Jesus, if you just hadn't let that happen, then this wouldn't have, you know, like, this blame game and Jesus is just like Martha Martha he's asking her to move the stone and she's like no body stinks like it, it, it's been in there four days don't do it and he said did I not tell you that if you would believe in me you would see the glory of God wow. and that just hit me like a ton of bricks like she's looking at all of the re reality of what's going on she she's in all of the emotional turmoil of just, you know, losing a brother and going, Jesus, like you could have prevented this. You know, she's, she's in the mess and Jesus is like, remember, I told you, if you just believe in me, you'll see the glory of God. Love and that. it just struck me, you know, for her, the glory of God was her brother was resurrected from the dead. In our lives, the glory of God can look totally different. And honestly, it doesn't matter what the glory of God is. You know that when the glory of God comes, it's going to be good. It's going to be healing. Yeah. It's going to be reconciling. So we just believe in Jesus and trust him with the result. Trish, uh, in a baseball analogy, I think you just hit a home run. That is so important what you shared. And I want to thank you. Our time is up. Look forward to when you come back again. And as you pray for us, we're praying for you. So be encouraged. Thank you for being so real, so helpful and uh, for being a part of the perspective. Folks, stay tuned. I'm going to be right back in just a moment. One in five Canadians struggle with a mental illness. Hi, my name is Alan Gallant, and I'm the executive director of Agord Network Ministries, a ministry that my wife and I founded based on my own crisis. Our ministry is to help anyone that's struggling with the mental health. We target the church and the believer in Jesus. And our aim is to help you move forward in your mental wellness. As you've been discussing with Trish Purdy, navigating life, whether it's parenting, whether it's work, or all the other things that compose our lives, can be challenging. And that's why we've created the Perspective Devotional. It gives you a brief outline of every talk that I'm going to give in the course of the month. Plus, there's also a reading for Saturday and Sunday. It helps you to go through the scriptures in an orderly way. There are some comments that I make in each book. Uh, in each chapter, and I hope you'll write to us today, prayer at the perspective TV, and say, send me a copy of this book. And if you do that, we'll put you on our mailing list. We need your mailing address. We'll send you September's, and then we'll send you October's as well, so that you can track with us. What a great devotional book, and you can order one for a friend as well. So, what are we going to learn today? as we process what we've discussed with Trish, as we're unpacking scripture, what, how interesting Paul is writing from Philippians chapter three. And in verse 17, he gives us an answer to navigating life. He says, brothers and sisters, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example 
you have in us. For many of whom I've often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body. Here it is by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. So the, the, the quick answer that we're going to unpack today is that we need to put in front of our kids healthy role models. And I think what Trish said about apologizing uh, was so important to hear as a parent. Also to realize that many times as parents, we live with guilt and shame. So I need to know how do I move through that? And I need to be reminded from the role models of scripture that we are called to live as conquerors, not as defeated people. You know, when we were kids, um, we enjoyed, okay, I enjoyed annoying my siblings. Guess how? By imitating them and repeating everything they said at the table. Huh. It was just an annoying thing that a little bratty brother would do. And lucky for me that mom was close by or else I might not be here to share that little tidbit of family humor. Well, Paul is talking actually about being an imitation of Christ, representing him, reflecting him. He talks about being lights in the world and doing things. How are we to do without grumbling or complaining? If I pass that pearl of wisdom on to my kids, whether they're living at home or whether they're adult kids, you know, quit complaining, quit grumbling. Do I'm doing it with a sour look or do I have the expression of the love of Jesus in my face? Or even more important, do I go about life without grumbling and complaining? What are my kids here at the table? Oh, they always do things wrong. They're always this. They're always that. Paul says, imitate me and keep your eyes on those who have gone before to walk as examples that you have. He's going to talk later on about two guys, Timothy and Epaphroditus, men that were exemplary. Oftentimes, though, we get um, disenfranchised because we are surrounded by a world that expects leaders, politicians, Olympians to almost lie and cheat. But Paul is raising the standard and he says, follow my example and not those who are opposed to the cross of Christ. As we wrap up today, I want you to think about what it means to walk in sync with Jesus so that his spirit will live in you and flow through you so that you can imitate and reflect him well. And we can't do it in our strength, but he asks us to ask for his help. And when we do that, he's always promised to hear. So call that number on the screen. There are people there to pray with you, to help you, and write to me, prayer at theperspective.tv, so that we can help you in this journey called life. 